you know, we're in a situation now in the world where I think 67, 68% of the, the world's population are, or the UK's population at least, are overweight and about 27% are obese. So that is, um, yeah, like two thirds of the population are overweight, which is a crazy, crazy number. And, and people are, are lost. They don't know what to do about it. Two thirds of the UK population is overweight, says Harry. Harry is a really interesting guy. I met Harry during a storytelling workshop I was delivering at the Steam House in Birmingham. And he told me he didn't really have a story. So this interview, which is one of the longest interviews I've done in a while, apart from the two parters that I do from time to time, really the first part of it is mostly about Harry's story and how he got started in business. And it's really, really interesting in how he discovered himself and how he discovered what he wanted to do. And the fact that he's now helping people with weight loss and targeting that at a very specific audience is really interesting. And I'm, I'm somebody who's battled with weight loss through my whole life. And we got into a really interesting discussion when we were talking about the topic of weight loss and, <clears throat> excuse me, my beliefs in how we've all been programmed and brainwashed by food industry and supermarkets and shops that sell junk food. Anyway, go and have a listen. Some really great education in here as well. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Harry. How are you today? <laughs> Hello, I'm really good, having a really good day. It's Monday and it's sunny. Well, that's unusual in the UK. So yeah, I concur. When the sun shines in this country, it's uh, unbeatable. So brilliant. Bit chilly this morning walking the dog, but that's good. Got my heart pumping and <laughs> fresh air into my lungs. But nice that it was dry and the kind of storms that we've had have slowed down a little bit uh, for now. Yeah, so, um, I, I, was gonna say, I was going to say I usually go out for a morning walk and I nearly got blown over this morning, actually, yeah. even though it was sunny. Yeah, I know. I know. It's not so bad when it's sunny, but when it's like pouring with rain at the same time, that's not good. <laughs> no, and it snowed yesterday as well. I know it did. I know it did. Yeah. Yeah. Ever so short amount of time. But yeah, we definitely did see it snow for the first time this year. Okay, so um, let's get started. Um, the first question that I ask everybody is to share a little bit about your personal life. So that means where you were born. Yeah, we want to know where it all started. Um, a bit about your education, uh, where you now live, if you moved around abroad in the UK, and then and then we'll transition into how you got into work. So over to you, Harry. Awesome. So yeah, I grew up in Hereford, Herefordshire, oh. the rural, um, the rural countryside. So I was born in in Hereford, and yeah, the beginning of my life started out in the middle of nowhere. Really, one of the most rural places you can get in the UK. And yeah, so I feel that kind of influenced me quite a lot mm. uh, growing up um, in that kind of environment. So yeah, um, I was. I was born in Hereford, as I said, and grew up there. And over my life, I've, I've not really moved around much, but I live in Birmingham now, Birmingham, UK. I've done quite a lot of traveling, so I, I do know a lot of different places. I've just been working out, actually, working out how many countries I've been to. Hmm. And I'm on number 38. Wow. So, yeah. Uh, so I enjoy traveling. <laughs> and what about, were you, did you go to school in Hereford? So I actually went to school in Wales, in Monmouth. So, oh, okay. Yeah, every day across the border. Right. Uh, so I can say I went to school in a different country to where I was living. Yeah. 
And yeah, Monmouth is an interesting place. I don't know if you've ever been there. I have maybe once. Yeah, not. I mean, I know the name. I've definitely travelled near it or through it. So, so tell us about it. <laughs> um, it's a very um, sort of borderline Welsh town, and mm. it, I don't know what I want to really say about it, but it's a place that I don't know. To be honest, I said it's interesting, mm. but yeah, it's just that word came out of my mind. Right. And what did you do all your education there? So, I mean, kind of primary school, secondary school. So I actually did primary school in a school called Whitchurch Primary School. Mm. And that's about 15 minutes away from Monmouth, back in the UK, right. back, in, back in England. And yeah, I was there obviously until 11 or 12. And then um, my parents sent me to Monmouth Comprehensive School, where I did my GCSEs and A levels, and then I decided to go to university and came up to Birmingham. So right, yeah, okay. So that's that's one of the reasons why you went to Birmingham, is it? Yeah, it's actually my second time in Birmingham. So I spent my university life here, went back to Hereford, got kind of bored of the countryside, and then came back. Right. <laughs> Well, because you wanted to see city life as a teenager or? Yeah, so like, I love the countryside and the countryside is where I grew up and where I kind of shaped myself. Mm. But coming to the city and learning about city life and having things near me, accessible and like actually having things um, to do actually just, yeah, it gave me um, a bit more um like want so i kind of started missing the city a bit and that social thing in the countryside there's hardly any people mm. and i feel that that shaped me a lot when i was younger and i actually yeah i found it hard socially like because i went to school somewhere wasn't necessarily close to where i lived and yeah, once I started mixing with people, I started wanting to, to wanting that more. So yeah, going back to the countryside, although it was my roots, I wanted to put myself in a situation where I actually developed a bit more socially and had people around me. And when when you went to university, which university did you go to? The University of Birmingham. Okay, and what what degree did you do there? So at the University of Birmingham, I studied environmental geoscience. So it's kind of geology, um, environmental stuff. Mm. And um, story about that, actually, I, I went there initially to study computer science. So one of my big hobbies and interests is technology, computers, things like that. But it didn't really agree with me. And so I changed within two weeks. Right. <laughs> Why <laughs> yeah. did it not agree with you? Um, it was a big jump in terms of what it required, and I'm not a very um, maths-based person, and although in school I did very well in it, mm. the, the jump to where it took you in university required a completely different, um, I, I guess, skill set and method of thinking, and it was completely different, and I just couldn't cope with it. Mm. And then why did you choose, I mean, that's quite a, what did, did you call it, geoscience? Environmental geoscience. Environmental, I mean, I've never even heard of a course like <laughs> that. <laughs> Not that I'm an expert on university courses, don't get me wrong, but what, why that and what did it entail? It sounds fascinating. And did living in the countryside have an impact on you choosing that? Yeah. So if you think of um, the word geoscientists, that's kind of a better way to remember it. Um, yeah, I think so a lot. Like I grew up in the countryside, as I said, and when things are around you start to notice them and care about them and um, it becomes one of your values. So, mm. yeah, I really sort of kind of resonated with stuff like that. And when I did decide to quit the computer science course, I was already in Birmingham. And I had to um, like sort of make a decision. So 
I wrote down a few courses I would be interested in. And although this sounds really bad, I went to several departments and asked them if I can join a course late. And this was the one that accepted me. Ah, right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So there was a passion there for the topic as well. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I wasn't going to do something that I hated. My, my list... My list of subjects that I was interested in doing was um, quite similar, actually. It was biology, um, the environmental geoscience, and quite a different one, psychology as well. Oh, okay. That's interesting. And did it... I mean, I know, you know, th these are unfair questions to ask because... You know, when we're younger, we think we got everything worked out in terms of the direction that we want to go in. And I know, even with myself, that I had no idea which direction I wanted to go in, apart from getting a job and earning money so that I can be free and independent and spend money off my own back. And But was there um, a motive at all in terms of the direction that you wanted to go into once you left university for that course or not really? Interesting question. Um, yeah, I've got quite strong thoughts and opinions on that. So yeah, I'm really big into um, creating a life with freedom and doing something that I want to do that is me, that um, I don't consider a job. So yeah, it did have um, some influence. And although back then, again, like you said, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I was kind of forced into choosing environmental geoscience. Plus also, as you know, the schooling system forces you down that route of um, doing GCSEs, A-levels, university, and then job. Mm. Uh, so I was kind of on that path. And so yeah, at that time, I was following like where I was being pushed and I was doing what I thought I should be doing. So, yeah, um, ask me the question again. I've forgotten the exact, exact question. Yeah, so so when when you were doing the course or when you decided to do the course or even um, doing that degree, what... Were you thinking of something you would do after you left university with that? Yeah, I wanted to do something in the environment. It was always like a big value of mine. Yeah. And another, like I said before, another big uh, thing that's in my life is traveling. So with the environmental industries, there's opportunities to do things all around the world. So it was something that I'd thought about and something that I was excited about. Mm. But I never actually went into it. And why not? So what happened? Um, it, while I was in, in university, I started um, a new route, let's call it. So I started just playing around on the internet with um, different things. Like I said before, I was interested in computers and things like that. Yeah. And I started creating some simple websites and that pushed me onto my new path. So my new path, which kind of pushed me out of the, uh, I guess, the, the career um, funnel that I was talking about before and onto my um, thing of working for myself, which I do now. Mm. Okay. So what, what, I mean, so did you go and get a job then in that sphere or in that, that, that area or...? So, yeah, um, while I was doing my course, environmental geoscience, I assumed I would start working in that. Yeah. Um, while I was doing the course, like I said, I started messing around with things on the internet. I started making a little bit of money through um, adverts on my website. Right. So I'd started kind of something else while I was doing my, um, my degree. Right. And when I finished my degree... I was still in a position of not really knowing what I wanted to do or go into. I tried to go for a job in that area, like a really, really easy job, just because yes. I saw it was, um, I saw it was advertised, and I thought I'll just go for this interview just to um, get some interview experience. And I didn't get the job, 
and it, they told me that I was overqualified for it. And it kind of, it kind of um, made me think it wasn't for me because although they said I was overqualified, I didn't get a job that sh- should have been um, easy to get. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do and I wasn't really kind of focused on anything. So I went traveling and this is something else that pushed me into another really, really important aspect of my life and something that now I love and do all the time. So yeah, I went traveling and because I was kind of like a person that wasn't that confident in pushing myself and doing new things, I went traveling with a friend. So we got an interrail pass. So that's basically the the train Mm -hmm. in in Europe where you get a a ticket that is valid for two, three or four weeks. So we flew to, flew to Italy. We got two flights. We got a flight to Italy, a a flight back from Birmingham and back from Birmingham, got a flight to Italy back from Germany. I meant to say Berlin to Birmingham and this interrail pass. And we just flew and filled in all the, the bits in between. We didn't get any accommodation, no plans. We had a rough idea of some countries we could go to, but we just worked it out as we went along. Right. Completely winging it. And that, that, that kind of thing, it creates problems, but also exciting problems. You don't know where you're going to stay or what's going to happen. Mm. What did that, I mean, how long did you do that for? So that was only, I think, about two and a half, three weeks, maybe. Right. Um, that was my initial trip. And that was, like I said, I went with a friend. And that's what pushed me onto this um, traveling um, bug. So right. my next trip after that, I did on my own. I was confident enough to um, kind of do it on my own. I say that, actually. <laughs> I'm lying. I'm lying. So my next trip, I went to South America. I went to Peru and Bolivia. Yes. And I didn't have anyone to go with. And I still felt a bit apprehensive and anxious on about going by myself. So I went on to a travel forum. I think it was like gapyear.com and wrote a message saying, does anyone, does, would anyone like to go to um, South America, Peru? Right. And I got a message from a guy from America and we arranged to yeah meet in the airport in Peru and go on this little trip, which was, again, it wasn't very long. It was, I think about two weeks. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I went, I went to Peru kind of my, on my own. I met this guy I'd never met before. Mm. Uh, turned out to be super cool. Um, but on that trip, things happened, which pushed me into more uncomfortable situations. And I kind of developed through these situations. So he was a very, um, what's the word? Um, relaxed and um, no care in the world kind of guy. Mm. Um, not, not in a bad way at all, but he spent all his money. So he had to go home. So I was left alone in um, in Peru where I thought I'd have a traveling companion. Yes. So it pushed me into, it pushed me into, yeah, that uncomfortable environment, doing things on my own and planning on my own and traveling on my own. So it, it was good because I was thrust into that situation and had to deal with it. And I developed and started to enjoy it and work out how I could do it on my own. Uh, How old were you when you were doing all that? Um, So that was just after I had finished university. So um, I think 22. Right, right. So, I mean, there was almost like you pushed yourself into kind of self-development for yourself. (laughs) Yes. In terms of, you know, going into uncomfortable situations and grow as a result of it. Exactly. And it's something that in my life I've discovered is so important and really works. Seeking uncomfortable situations and pushing myself into them because uncomfortable situations are things that will help you get something positive, I think, most most of the time. Mm. It's being able to be aware of them, recognize them, realize that you're uncomfortable for a reason. It's not necessarily something bad. It's usually apprehension or fear or something of the unknown and getting over it 
will lead to something positive. Yeah, I mean, it makes such an amazing point there because the positive bit in all of that is recognizing in yourself that actually you are capable of overcoming that. You are capable of coping with the uncomfortable situation and getting through it. And actually, you didn't die. <laughs> you know exactly. Yes. Yeah. And um, because that's the big thing, I think, with most people that you know, fear and doubt. I've come to the conclusion is the the root of suffering, mm -hmm. and happiness is the absence of suffering. And this is my like. I've mentioned this a couple of times on my podcast with people now because um, I'm trying to spread the word so people can get it. But fear and doubt is when you're in that situation where, oh, no, I can't do it, you know, because you're doubting yourself, you go into fear and that stops you in your tracks. You can't, literally, you can't move forward as a result. And it does take a lot. And I guess what you were doing at a, quite a young age because mm – -hmm. The realization doesn't normally kick in until the frontal lobe is fully developed at the age of 25. So uh, at the age of 22, for you to be pushing yourself in un into an uncomfortable situation and, and um, seeing how you would cope was very early on in your, in your life, really. Yeah, and I think a lot of it developed or happened because of my my upbringing in the countryside, I was probably further behind than a lot of other people. Mm. And I needed to develop, I needed to develop very quickly. And seeing those situations, I was, I was able to de develop quickly. Yes. And to myself into new environments, I was able to develop quickly. And especially traveling, because if you're in one place, you're influenced by the culture and the people around you. And that's often very fixed and it develops you into a certain person that conforms to that. Traveling, you get a mixture and you start seeing the, the extremes of how humans can behave and act. And you can start forming yourself around these as well, like seeing what's the possibility. Like you're not confined to your own city or your own country. You can see what people do in other countries and um, yeah, how they express themselves, how they speak. Um, how they interact with others, and it gives you a bigger, I guess, um, palette to work from. It 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 does make a massive impact on you. Yeah, seeing other cultures, I, I agree with you. I was exposed to that at the age of thirteen, fourteen, living in South America, a place called Suriname. Yeah, and I saw poverty for the first time, and I I didn't appreciate poverty at all. I'd come from the Netherlands where, although we weren't rich, but we had everything that we needed. You know, we weren't short of anything. I didn't go hungry. Mm -hmm. I had clothes. I had toys. Not much. Secondhand clothes, you know, one toy or something. But when I saw poverty, it was when we, in, in those countries, in, you had, you know, people that helped you around the home and we were taking somebody back to a house in the car and we dropped her off and I asked my mother I said oh where is her house I can see her shed where is her house and she said no that is her house the shed is her house that's where she lives in mm -hmm. and I, I couldn't believe it I was just gobsmacked at the age of 13 I just that made such a massive impact on me which still still allows me to be passionate about charities and volunteer in this country. And it was all because of that first impact. So I agree with you, traveling has a long lasting impact on your life and how you see the world uh, around you. So Peru for a few weeks, some days on your own, did you continue traveling or did you come back and try and get a job? Yeah, so I did. I did contri uh, continue traveling. So I was yeah in Peru and Bolivia for about two weeks. It was a round trip. So 
um, I'm not sure if you're aware or the listeners are aware of the geography, but um, Peru going south, you hit Bolivia and La Paz is one of the, the um, initial cities. And then went, I went back up and um, left Peru. While I was there, I did um, some really cool stuff. Um, the Inca Trail, sorry, I didn't do the Inca Trail. I went to Machu Picchu. Um, I didn't do the Inca Trail bit. I didn't have time, um, which was, yeah, an amazing experience. Um, if you've not heard of the Inca Trail, anyone, or and Machu Picchu, um, so something definitely to look up. Yeah, I definitely heard of it. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, when you kind of like write stuff down, you've done in your life, uh, the big things, that's one of the things on my list. Um, so, a friend yeah. of mine is going to Peru, I think, in September. <laughs> so, yes, oh, awesome. to do that very, very thing. Yeah, so it's, a, it's on a lot of people's bucket list, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. Um, so, yeah, I did continue travelling. So I, I went back and lived with my parents for a couple of months. I think it was around September, October time that I went to Peru and Bolivia. So I had it like a couple of months and it was Christmas, and I was kind of thinking about what I wanted to do. Um, at the same time, I was still doing the thing, messing around on the internet, mm-hmm. kind of making a bit of money with just websites and advertising. Back then, it was a lot easier to make money online. People would click on adverts, and you get a few pence per per click if you had good traffic. So yes. I was making a bit of money, and it was kind of... I guess creating a fire inside me, like warming me up for how I could work by myself and create money um, without having um, a job, inverted commas, something that I had control of, something that I decided, something I put the effort into and got out what I put effort into, if you know what I mean. Yes. Um, And then after Christmas, this was back in 2006. Seven, I think. Mm-hmm. I think so. I I decided to go on another another trip. I really enjoyed South America, Peru and Bolivia, and I decided I needed to do the other side, so Brazil and Argentina. Right. So I, I booked another trip. So I I landed in uh, Rio de Janeiro, and unbeknown at the time. That landing in Brazil would like shape me for the future. It's been such a, a big influence on my life. Wow. So just to jump, cut that out bit, cut that bit of the story out for a second, yeah. um, explain the trip. So I went from um, Brazil down Argentina and uh, that was, uh, that was a bigger trip. It was, how long was it? It was more than a, more than a month, I think. I can't remember the timings, to be honest. But, yeah, I started in Rio, and I I didn't like it to start with. It was very different to Peru and Bolivia. The, um, the west side of South America is very poor, so Peru and Bolivia are very, very different to Brazil and Argentina. Mm. Brazil mm. is, is a, a rich country, although they have a lot of poverty and a big, big, big gap between the rich and the poor. At one point, a few years ago, they were, the, I think, the fifth or the sixth biggest GDP in the world. Yes. And there is a lot of money. There's a lot of resources. They're a big country. It's just there's a lot of problems due to a lot of different things, and it's it shaped the country in a different, a different way to, say, the USA, which is, again, very rich and very big. Yes. Um, so, yeah, you can see I've got a lot of opinions and I spent a lot of time in, in Brazil over my life since then. So that's what I meant by it shaped um, a lot of right. how how I am. So um, I... Was there anything specific that happened there? Yeah, I'm trying to think what it was. Um, it was, yeah, it took it took a little bit to get me to like the country because, like I said, it was very different to uh, Bolivia and Peru. And what drew me to those was the the rawness and the um, yeah, I don't want to say poverty, but they were very different to the UK. And I liked that experience of traveling through somewhere that was very different. And right. Brazil straight away was a lot different, and I didn't resonate with it. 
also they're the only um, one of the only countries in South America that don't speak Spanish. I don't speak Spanish, but I kind of got used to listening to it and yes, learn a few words. And I kind of um, in that time period where I'd gone back to my parents' house after leaving Peru, I started to learn a little bit of it and. I felt a bit more comfortable. Whereas Brazil, Portuguese. Yes. And very different. Um, so, yeah, I, I travelled in Brazil and I actually, I met a girl. <laughs> so. Ah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, now we get to it. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, it made me, um, what's the word, start to like the country a bit more due to my experience. And obviously I was traveling, so I didn't stay with her. Um, I continued on my travels down into Argentina and um, eventually flew back to the UK. But I still kept in contact with her and it made me go back. So I had a second trip to Brazil. Right. And again, I don't remember the exact timings. I think it was later that year, probably um, at the latter end of the year. So the initial trip was at the beginning and I think my second trip to Brazil was um, maybe, yeah, October, November at the end. And I'm s- guessing it's 2007, I think. And and the girl was Brazilian then? Yes. 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 So how um, did you communicate? So, yeah, Brazil is a very interesting country because they, although they've got 200 million people and they're super kind of advanced and, like I said, at one point were like, really really high on the gdp list they're not very good with english at all no really really bad really 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 bad like not even words and she actually spoke some english so it was very different and that's what um yeah sort of got me speaking to her because she speaks some words in english a bit more than words yes i was actually taking a boat trip to an island so it's quite a big island where you could um, sort of stay there and um, do hiking and stuff. And um, I was on the boat and she, I think she recognised that I wasn't Portuguese, Portuguese, Brazilian. Uh, she recognised I didn't speak Portuguese and she wanted to practice her English. So she started talking to me. Mm. And it kind of went from there. So, yeah, interaction <laughs> creates, <laughs> creates okay. friends and relationships. So... I guess the reason, just listening to that story, why Brazil made such a big impact on you is because, to begin with, you didn't you didn't like it because it was so different. The language was different. The culture was different. It was just so different. It didn't you didn't warm to it to begin with. But then after you met this person, it became a different experience for you because you were interested in her and the fact that she'd made the effort to try and speak English with you made it a different experience for you in the end. Yes, yeah. And that is my love of Brazil now. Like The people are so different to mm. any other people in the world. Like the energy, the, the way they interact, the extent they interact, the emotion, the like, the physical contacts, like people in the UK, like you don't really touch people when you're talking. But in Brazil, everyone is hugging. They're using like physical touch, and yes. it's part of like what we are. But like I said before, our culture defines our limits, and in the UK, we're not very um, expressive, are we? No, no, not at all, not at all. And yeah, when I when I went to Brazil, I saw a lot of different people traveling. I saw like people in big groups and I saw people that were alone like me. And the people that go in big groups, they don't really experience the country. They they go there, they they have their friends, they already know. They go and do some of the tourist attractions, they go out and have fun and maybe drink as well. If you're on your own, you get a whole different experience. Yes. People see you alone and they want to interact and it yes. creates opportunities. You mm. probably had it yourself. Um, so it's one of the things I love, one of the reasons I love traveling alone because not only will I force myself to 
interact because I need to, people will see that I'm alone and interact with me. Yes. So, yeah, it, it happened a few times and create created a few sort of um, monumental, um, I guess, turning points in my life. So that was the first one in Brazil um, with the girl. And that's what forced me to go back, um, learn more about the country, which I'm going to say, when you don't like something, it's never the um, yeah the end. Like you can start liking something. So I almost didn't like Brazil, and it almost um, yeah didn't make me want to stay there. No, no. And si since then, it's had such a big impact on my life. I think back and I always think, what if that hadn't happened? What if I hadn't um, yeah met this girl? And what happened? What would have happened? Like where would my life be now? Because since then, it's opened so many doors. I've learned a new language. I've learned to speak Portuguese. Oh, I've wow. So, yeah, yeah I've, I've met so many other people as well. And it's led to other traveling experiences in Europe even as well. Yeah. And m most of my life now is defined by um, things that happen from my friends who live in Brazil mm. or have moved away from Brazil, who interact with me, who ask me to do things, who create experiences that I'm invited on and yeah and are you still in touch with the girl um yeah occasionally um we're we're friends um yeah. I, I don't remember last time I spoke to her but um it's just because that happens life kind of happens don't doesn't yes. it and yes sure um, okay wow that I mean that's that's pretty major that's shaped a lot of what your life is like today <laughs> And any more traveling after that? Or did you go and get a job? <laughs> so, yeah, um, after that, my my career in terms of environment and geoscience never happened. No. And I continued doing what I was doing online. So I started making websites, nothing special. But around somewhere around that time, there was one of the big football competitions it must have been um, was it World Cup 2010 or maybe even a bit before that. Um, was it World Cup? I can't remember. It's either one of the Euros or World Cup. Yeah. And I um, I did some bets like a lot of people do on football. Mm -hmm. And while I was doing these bets, I, I noticed there's a few sites which um, they compared like the different companies and you could get a free bet on – on the betting site, so like William Hill, Labbrokes, um, Bet365, they all offered kind of welcome offers, which yeah. you bet a certain amount and get that amount again um, for free. And these these websites were comparing the, the different offers. And I found it interesting. And I looked into it, and these people had created a website, like I was doing, um, but it was the first kind of form of comparison websites. Right. So you know You've got stuff like gocompare.com, compare yep. the market, you switch, all these market sort of market comparison websites which compare insurance, um, mobile phone deals, everything. Um, so these were comparing, yeah, free bet offers basically. And I worked out what they did. They basically signed up to the um, betting companies, um, what they call affiliate programs. Yes. And when you went to one of these comparison websites, clicked on the offer, joined up, um, this website would get paid a commission. And it's the same way as all the comparison websites work that you may have used yourself. Yes. Um, so what I'm leading on to is I created my own. I thought, oh, I'll do this too. And um, that was my first real proper business. So right. a comparison website for um, comparing free bet offers. Very simple. And it was back when the internet, again, was a lot easier to uh, to do stuff on because less people were doing it. Mm. But that was my first business. Wow. So you set up your own business then to begin with. You didn't go and work for anybody as such. No, I never. So up until this day, I've never had a an official proper job. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I've done like odd jobs and stuff. Um, I've worked in the garden center. Mm. I've worked for my my dad. My dad um, is a pig farmer. Right. 
until recently had his own um, pig farm. Um, so I worked for him for a while. And what else have I done? Um, yeah, nothing, nothing I can remember um, where I've been tied down to anything. So I feel very, very privileged to have been um, kind of pushed into, I, I don't know if I should say pushed into, the path I've taken has worked out for me. Mm. And I guess, you know, when we were talking early on about putting yourself in an uncomfortable situation where you had to survive and get through it and overcome any fear and doubts, you must have done the same when you were creating your own small business. Yeah. To to help, like, I was at my parents' house, so I didn't... Although I paid them rent, mm. I didn't have massive overheads. And I didn't have big, big things that depended on me earning a lot of money. Mm. Um, starting out on the internet is very cheap. Like you can spend a lot of money, or you can spend like ten dollars. You can buy a domain name and um, a web hosting package and um, create a website in minutes. So yes. it's not something that needs a lot of money behind it. It's not like opening a shop or something where you have to have stock and it depends on, yeah, you're selling that stock to earn money. So there was nothing, I didn't actually invest anything in it really. Mm. Just time. And um, like you said, it's belief because when you start from nothing and like have to believe that putting all this work and time into something you're doing will create uh, a business, will create um, an income. It, it is belief that you need because like you don't know when it's going to happen. It's just yeah. that that belief. And yeah, it's one of those things that I guess your personality um, defines what you're good at because a lot of people want that security, want that routine. They yes. want a fixed job where they're getting money every month. They know how much they're getting. They don't want to rely on, um, I'm not going to say luck because I don't really believe in luck, but they don't want to rely on their own uh, motivation to turn up every day and um, believe that what they're doing is going to work. Mm. And that's fine as well. Some people that works for. And so that that was that comparative comparison site that you then developed and you earned some presumably clicks from. Yeah. So um, as with any website, you have to get traffic to. So that was my um, my focus, getting traffic to the website. Um, the visitors would click on the uh, offers, sign up to um, the betting companies, mm -hmm. and I'd get commission from that. So that nice. was, yeah, that was how it worked. And because it was a very passive thing, I wasn't interacting with customers. There was no specific times I had to work. No. Uh, it enabled me to be quite free with my time. Although I worked a lot, I was able to... Um, use the time when I wanted to and I also travel and work at the same time. So that was another defining point in my life, like being able to have a, a job. I don't like saying job, but um, yeah, for, for this um, explanation, have a job where I was able to travel. So since then, I've visited, like I said before, uh, 38 different countries mm -hmm. into Brazil 10 times <laughs> in the last 10 years i've learned to speak portuguese i've got um hundreds of friends around the world who've given me amazing experiences um i've learned to um to interact in new ways i've learned how people can um interact differently i've not been defined i've not been um limited to yeah where i live and it's been an amazing experience yeah Brilliant. And is that business still going today? So, yeah, that business um, is still going. And I think it was about two years ago, two years and a bit, I, I got a business partner. So I kind of did a, did a Dragon's Den style deal. Mm -hmm. So um, I retained a, a partnership profit um, percentage kind of thing in the, in the business. Right. And I, kind of, I went off in a, a new direction. Right. So one of my big things in life is health and fitness. And um, in my free time, 
because I had, like I said, freedom and I could do courses and stuff while I was um, running my business, I did spend some time um, learning and learning has become something I really, really enjoy after school, after university, something yes. I spent a lot of time doing. Yeah. Um, so I did my personal training qualifications and I became qualified as a personal trainer. Right. This is exercise personal training. Yes, yes, exercise, yeah. So In a uh, gym or outside of the gym, so in your own gym or? So, yeah, that's what it qualified me for. Yes. Um, but I never actually worked in a gym as a personal trainer. Um, I did it because I wanted to kind of upskill myself, understand it more. Yes. Um, yeah, basically, yeah, get more knowledge. And it was something that I was really interested in. Um, slowly over my life, I'd kind of just um, built that value of health and um, looking good and um, performing good as well. Like a lot of people with health, they think of the, like the looks and the way you look, but a lot of it is about your strength, your speed, the way you feel, um, how yeah, like how strong you are, and what you can what you can do. Performance basically, and um, if you feel good, um, it it kind of gives you more. Um, a drive and you can get stuff done and um, do more stuff in your life. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I started learning things and I did loads of qualifications. I've done, um, what have I done? I did my personal training qualifications. I did um, further qualifications related to those in uh, referral from GP. Um, so this qualification was allowing me to train people um, who um, GPs referred uh, out who needed extra um, help in terms of exercise for if they had obesity, diabetes, things like that. Um, I've done qualification in biomechanics, so human movement. And like I said, a lot of these, they developed from my own learning and mm -hmm. um, biomechanics one, because I spent a lot of time sat down during my teenage years and like a lot of people do, um, but I was working at a computer and I started getting a lot of like problems with my body, like pain and things. And it's from compensation. Your body adapts to the position you're in. And um, yeah, I started getting problems like walking, like pain, walking, things like that. Yes. And I went to the doctor and they referred me to physiotherapist and stuff. And it didn't really help me at all. And it was affecting my life quite a bit because I, at that point, jumping back a few years, um, uh, when this st first started, it was around my GCSEs, actually. I started running just to, um, during my exam period, to get um, that freedom in my mind to, to do something in between revising for exams. But I had to stop because I got pain and stuff. And yeah. It affected me because you know how exercise is good for the mind. And then when you can't do it, you kind of, you're lost. Yeah. Um, so I spent a lot of time trying to work out, like, how to fix myself and when I discovered this course uh, on biomechanics, I kind of did it to help myself. Sure. So I just, I kind of, yeah, fix myself by learning how to do it rather than letting other professionals help me. Yeah. And it's, it's such an amazing um, qualification. It's too led me to a lot of other things in my life. And um, you can see I'm quite passionate about it. So mm. um, yeah, biomechanics and human movement and helping people, um, stop pain basically mm. um, so that's one part of it but yeah the other part is um, helping people lose weight and um, feeling better about themselves being healthier you know we're in a situation now in the world where I think 67 68% of the, the world's population are or the UK's population at least are overweight and mm. about 27% are obese mm. so it, that is, um, yeah, like two thirds of the population are overweight, which is a crazy, crazy number. And and people are, are lost. They don't know what to do about it. And the government isn't are lost really as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah. Yes. They're Everybody's really, lost. Exactly. What to do they're about not really, it? Yeah. They're not really successful. So, um. Yeah, my new direction going from my previous business, still working online, has been to try and create a business, try and, or try and help people um, lose weight 
through what I've learned. And what I've learned is not just through courses, it's through working with myself, working with um, like reading books, reading uh, studies, reading a lot of information from clever people. Because what I found is you can go to university, you can do a course, but there's a lot more around different subjects. And universities, although this is a, a bad thing to say, are often um, quite restrictive because their course material um, has to go through a lot of, um, uh, what do you call it, rigmarole and yep. um, processes to get it on the course. So although university is amazing and you learn a lot of things, um, people that do health courses are often lost afterwards because they're restricted to what they've learned. And university education has a, a big label on it and a, a big weight. You've got a degree, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're able to help people. So yeah, in the government, all these people that are highly qualified, they're, they're unable to um, to do anything to um, affect the situation because there are so many different factors to it. Um, so yeah, my new business has kind of developed from my value of health and fitness. Yes. And um, helping people online with weight loss. So um, I'll start with saying like a lot of people, when they want to lose weight, the first thing they think about is uh, maybe going to the gym and doing exercise. Mm. Now, yeah, that's fine. That's really good. But there's a bit more to it than that. So there's three main things you need to concentrate on. And yes, there's the exercise and movement, but there's also, of course, the food and nutrition. And then the big one is mindset, mm. because the way your mind works, your mind controls everything you do. So those previous two, the food and the exercise, that's defined by the way your mind works. And when I say your mind, I don't just mean your your conscious mind. So there's your your subconscious mind too, which is something I'm really interested in. Yes. Just to give listeners a, a brief explanation, if they've not really gone into it before, you've got your logical, conscious thinking mind. If you think of like a, a iceberg in water, you've got the bit that's sticking out, the bit you can see. So that could be your logical thinking mind. And it's your everyday activities that you decide to do, the things that um, you think about. But then you've got your subconscious mind. So this is the bit that's hidden away. That it's kind of where your things like your habits are stored. So habit is a shortcut for the brain. So as humans, we, we have a lot of things to do in our days. So the brain is very, very intelligent and it's been, it's, it's evolved to take shortcuts and save energy basically. So in the subconscious brain, things happen automatically and those could be good or bad things. Um, and a lot of it is, yeah, habit. So things you do in your day without really thinking about them. And this works a lot with uh, weight loss. So a lot of the things that don't serve you, that don't help you work towards your goals are mindset based things that you don't really think about. You don't really know about. So just to explain a bit more, like when people want to lose weight, they think logically and they think, oh, I want to lose weight. I want to lose, say, 10 pounds. And that's their conscious mind. But there's often a conflict in the subconscious mind, the bit that they don't really realize is there. There might be a reason, that, or there might be a lot of reasons why being overweight helps them, um, or beliefs why they can't lose weight that they don't really think about. And there's a big conflict. So unless their their subconscious and conscious mind are working together, it's very difficult to get the other two, the nutrition and the exercise to work for you. So this this is fascinating. I'm, I'm fascinated by the topic and the subject because my wife and I have been going through this journey for many years on our own and then together. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also a, I studied kinesiology uh, for three years and health and nutrition and everything else for, for many years. And you are so right that the, the subconscious mind and the habits that we develop is our biggest enemy uh, in all in, in just not just kind of being healthy. It's many things. You know, we talked about this right at the beginning when we talked about 
you know, the fear and doubt and about pushing through barriers or fears that we might have, which are all developed through habits as well. And, um, and I'd like to add to what you're saying is that we are also programmed, right? So the subconscious mind is also programmed and they're programmed by the food manufacturers in the world and the supermarkets where people do the majority, 80% of their, their nutrition shopping they do in supermarkets. So those companies, so the food manufacturers, as well as the people that are selling the stuff in the shops, the supermarkets, are the ones that are programming our mind. And they're programming our subconscious mind. And therefore, it, it's doubly hard. So not only do we have to change our habits, but we have to change the programming that has occurred in our brain for decades, decades that we've had to deal with. So that's why I often say it's not, I would say, at least 60, 70% of people's issues around weight is not their fault. It's the fault of the food manufacturers and the supermarkets that are selling the stuff. So now you have a massive, I believe, a massive thing to overcome. And that is, how do you pay attention to only nutritious and healthy food? And how do you stop paying attention to all the stuff that we are being programmed to purchase. Yeah, you make a really, really good point there, Michael. And it's a very difficult task. And to solve any problem, in my mind, the easiest way to solve a problem is to work out what you want and work out how to get there and then break it down into small steps that are manageable. So the one of the biggest problems I see with people trying to lose weight is they start where they are, they're overweight and they kind of think, I want to lose some weight. They maybe even put a number on it, want to lose 10, 20 pounds, and they change everything. They're really positive, they're motivated, which is good. And they say, yes, I'm going to eat perfectly, go to the gym five, seven days a week and do really well. And that is the biggest problem because... Mm -hmm. The motivation they have is kind of um, their downfall because they change too much and people think in black and white So, and they act in black and white. So yes, they might do really well for a few days, even a week. And some people that have really good willpower might even last two weeks, mm. three weeks. Mm. And they might eat well. They might go to the gym every day, but something in life will get in the way be it stress, job, work, same thing, um, friends, or some of these subconscious things that come into the mind through, um, yeah, smell, um, visual things, whatever, that are activating um, things you don't even realize in your mind. So the way to get around that to stop you sabotaging your progress, to stop you doing well for two weeks and then going back to how you were, like on and off the, the wagon kind of thing, thinking in black and white. It's the thinking grey and don't change everything. Realise that you can't change everything and change one or two things, positive changes that imagine a scale and the left-hand side is where you are now and the right-hand side is where you want to get to. You don't jump. It's not black and white. You kind of move a bit towards that right hand side you change a couple of things and work on them make them become habit make them become something that you feel strange not doing so the things that i usually tell people are go for a five minute walk and drink enough water in your day and quantify it and measure it make sure you know how much you are drinking like all these changes you have to know you have to measure it and you have to know how much you're you're doing and this is in the conscious mind. So um, what you want to do is do something in the conscious mind and it becomes so common that it moves into the unconscious mind, the subconscious mind, and then it becomes a habit. So we've done it enough for the brain to think, oh, yeah, 
this is something we can save energy on and just do it naturally. So with the water, a lot of people will say, yeah, I drink a lot of water. Um, I drink enough water. And then you ask them, oh, how much are you drinking? And they say, oh, about this much. Mm. Or, um, yeah, usually I drink this much. But they don't really know. No. And it's, it's, yeah, it's so easy as humans to, to trick yourself or not necessarily lie to yourself, but just be unaware. Maybe you do drink enough water, but maybe, say, on a Wednesday you drink less or on the weekend um, you eat more or something. And we kind of trick ourselves into thinking we're doing well, but because we're not measuring it and not really quantifying it, you can't see where you're going wrong. So You, you know what it is, though. Um, so uh, this is such a fascinating discussion. Um, the, the, because I've been on this roller coaster for decades, literally mm -hmm. decades. And for the first time in my life, in the past, or oh, when did we, start? May last year, May, June last year, I guess. So nearly a year, for the first time in my life ever, I, do, I no longer eat by, right? I might eat it very, very infrequently, but I no longer eat bread. And bread was my biggest Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. In terms of, doesn't matter what color it was, white, brown, you name it. And people go, oh yeah, well if you buy whole grain and you buy brown bread, that's okay for you. Forget it. You know, the bread. Once you start eating bread, you can't stop because it's so addictive. You know, it's an addictive substance. As far as I'm concerned, it's like cocaine. And uh, I grew up in Amsterdam, where the bread was like incredible you know you can't even get the kind of bread in the in this country that they served in the netherlands so mm -hmm. i became addicted to the product and for the first time in my life i'm no longer addicted to it but it's taken me years to come off the substance you know and oh i was completely educated in what the product consists of so the one thing that finally got it harry was that we bought a loaf of bread for my stepson because he was the only one eating it in the house and my wife and I were no longer eating it. Sliced white loaf from Lidl and it was in its wrapping and he didn't eat any of it. So we left it on the side. If he wanted to make toast mm -hmm. or whatever out of it, we just left it for him. Mm -hmm. And a week later, it was never opened and it still looked exactly the same. Two weeks later, we hadn't opened it and it still looked exactly the same. There was no mold on it, nothing. Three weeks later, four weeks later, only in the fourth week did some mold start to grow. This is a product that everybody is encouraged to eat, that the supermarkets stock, you know, ceiling high, that people buy every single day and eat non sandwiches, toast. It's become a religion. Uh, for people to eat bread and it's so harmful to us you know and only because I've been able to you have no idea the feeling it's given me inside to finally be able to stop that addiction now that's just one food substance can you imagine how many other food substances there are that are not good for us that people are addicted to you know, and that's just one example that has been, I know I've been brainwashed with that substance for all my life, all my life. And finally, finally, I've managed to, to break the addiction, break the addiction. And then, sorry, I'm, I'm on, a, <laughs> on, a, on a roll here. I just wanted to mention one guy that you might like to check out and the listeners as well. You probably know him already, a guy in America called Leo Babuta. And he has a website called zenhabits.net. And he talks exactly what you talked about in terms of breaking habits and small steps. He talked about this, this method that you use. If you say, for example, he says, if you want to go exercising, you want to go running. Okay. I mean, you could argue whether running is good for you or not, but let's say you go running and you want to start running. So get up the first morning, take your trainers, 
go downstairs to your front door or walk to your front door, go outside or whatever, put your trainers on and that's all you do on day one. Then you go back mm -hmm. inside. That's all you've done. Now on day two, go downstairs, put your trainers on. He breaks it down in tiny, tiny little steps. You do the same thing, put your trainers on. Now you're going to walk to the end of your drive or walk just a tiny bit and then walk back inside. And then you do that. You just keep increasing it very, very small. And the thing that happens, as you quite rightly say, is people go put their trainers on. They haven't run for six months or a year or two years or three years. They go running. They go running too far. They're in so much pain. Their muscles mm -hmm. ache, their knees ache, their brain aches. The next day they can't do it again because they've got so much muscle pain. They won't. I can't get out of bed because I went for a run yesterday. I nearly killed myself and now I can't do it the next day. There. And my role is over. Over to you again. <laughs> Yeah, you brought up a lot of things there. Um, I've not heard of him, no, but yeah, that's exactly what um, you should be doing, taking those small steps and reducing the resistance. If you wake up in the morning and think, I have to go for a 10K run, um, there's a bit like a lot of resistance there. Mm. If you yes. wake up in the morning and think, I have to put my trainers on and step out the door and come back, that's really easy. Yes. You can do that. And yes. it's it's building the habit and making it feel normal. Mm. Um. So yeah, bread. Bread is something that most people eat. It's a really easy food and it's got a lot of beliefs behind it. And um, it, it's not necessarily something that is is bad for you. A lot of people assume they have to cut out bread to lose weight, but weight loss is all about reducing your calories. The problem with bread, like you said, it's easy to eat, so you can overeat on it. and there's a principle called um, calories per bite. So the calories per bite principle is basically for a bite of food, how many calories are you getting out of it and how much is it filling you up? So let's just use like a quite extreme example, a piece of cake and an apple. If you take a bite out of an apple, there may be, I don't know, five calories in it. Mm -hmm. If you take a bite out of a piece of cake, there might be over 100 calories in it. And that bite is the same size, but you've got five versus 100 calories in your stomach now. Yes. So if you want to fill yourself up, um, like the obvious thing would be going for the, the low calories per bite foods. So with bread, it's quite high calories per bite. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it's very easy to overeat until you feel full. So a lot of people would do well cutting down their bread because they can replace that with something the equal volume fill themselves up the same, but at the same time reduce their calories. Yes. So a lot of people say with weight loss, yeah, I know what to do. I need to reduce my portions. It's not reducing portions because that's one of the biggest problems with weight loss. You reduce your portions and you're hungry and then you start um, craving and binging on things. Yes. You want to maintain the amount of food you're eating, but eat foods that have fewer calories. So if you imagine a plate or something, um, let's just take a, a common meal like um, chicken, some rice and a few bits of vegetables. A lot of people will have quite a lot of rice on the plate, a little bit of chicken and some vegetables. The the way, let's just put a number on that, say it's um, 600 calories. So if you reduce the amount of rice, then you become hungry because you've reduced the amount of food on the plate. You've reduced the calories, but you have reduced the amount of food, the volume. To maintain the amount of volume, all you would do is reduce the amount of rice. You still have some because you enjoy it and it's good to include things you enjoy, but increase the amount of vegetables. Replace the volume you've taken away or even more with some more vegetables. So broccoli, um, carrots, I don't want to list vegetables, but um, things you enjoy already as well. Yeah, and th there's a there's a guy in America who I absolutely love, and I'm listening to his book called How Not to Die, and mm -hmm. Dr. Michael but Greger. I don't know if you've come across him, mm -hmm. and he says, "How much rice shall I have with my vegetables?" Instead of mm -hmm. "How many vegetables shall I have with my rice?" 
Yes, yes. You know, so it's actually saying put the vegetables on your plate first, then decide how much rice shall I add to that. Yeah, it's when you're eating, it's how does it serve you? So what are the benefits of each of those um, parts of the plate? So you've got your protein source, which is usually an animal product. It could be vegetarian or vegan. I know there's a lot of people that have those values as well. Uh, you've got the fibrous vegetables, the vi fibrous carbs, which are the vegetables. And you've got your starchy carbs, which mm. are uh, things like bread, pasta, rice, uh, potatoes, um, oats, things like that. Uh, you've got, oh, you've got fats as well. Yeah. Uh, the things that serve you least are the starchy carbs. They're the things that are giving you a lot of energy, which in the past would have been great thousands of years ago because that's what you needed. Um, but today you've got overweight by eating those. Yes, they've got some vitamins and minerals, but you can get those from the vegetables. So the starchy carbs, they're serving you the least. So when you build your plate, build your meal, concentrate on the other two first. So mm. vegetables on the plate, protein on the plate, Protein is really good because it helps keep you full and helps build lean muscle, um, which gives you shape. And then think about the starchy carbs. So so the thing is, and we, we can give people this lesson about what to eat and not what to eat, and they will turn around and go, yeah, we know all that. We don't need to know that. You don't need to tell us. We already know what's good for us, which actually 99.9% .9 of the people already know what's good for them. Right. The, th the big question is, how do I stop my addiction to sugar, to alcohol, to bread, to pasta, to flour, to, you know, how do I stop the cocaine habit of food that isn't, you know, to the fast food, to the pizza, to the Chinese, to the Indian food, to the, you know, all of. But I deserve a treat, you know. I deserve a treat. I've been a good boy. I've been a good girl. You know, I want to go out on a night and have a nice big meal and a dessert and lots of alcohol and feel good about myself. But actually, I feel crap the next day because I've overeaten and I've overdrunk. And I think that's where the issue is. It's not teaching people what to eat. It's teaching people how, how to overcome the addiction. Yeah. Um, so while you were saying that, so many things came into my mind. I needed yeah. to write them down. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I don't even know where to start. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a really, really important thing to understand is not to cut things out that you enjoy because uh, you may have heard of the red button um, syndrome, not syndrome, um, the red button effect. Yeah. So no, I haven't. Tell us. <laughs> the red button effect is you... You show someone a red button and say, don't press this. What do they want to do? They want to press it. Mm. Mm. Of Just course. Wait. Yeah. They want to know what's going to happen. Or you tell someone, don't think about a big pink elephant. What comes into your mind? Pink elephant. Big yeah. pink elephant even. Yeah. yeah. Or you tell a child, don't, uh, I don't know, don't throw mud at your sister. What do they do? Throw mud. Mud at the sister, yeah, because they yeah. don't hear the word don't. They all hear do. That's it. So as humans, we're kind of programmed to um, want to do things we tell ourselves not to. And a lot of it is about the language you, we use. So we focused, with, with weight loss and everything, actually, we focus on very uh, what we call away from language. So that might be, I don't want to be fat. I don't want to eat unhealthily. I don't want to be unfit anymore. And the brain focuses on the words of fat, weight, unfit. And you kind of, you're being pulled towards it rather mm. than going away from it. And mm. um, so to start with, when you're creating a goal, you want to focus a lot on the, what we call towards language. So I want to be fit. I want to be healthy. Um, I want to be strong. I want to be, um, yeah, all the good things. So instead of thinking about all the negative words which your brain starts focusing on, you want to focus on those good things as well or even replace them. And that's a start. Like It starts putting you in a positive mindset. You're, you're focused on something that's good rather than being um, pulled towards the thing you don't want. Um, so what else have we got there? You mentioned about addiction. 
and uh, things like that. So with addiction, there's no actual evidence that people are addicted to food. Um, there's two types of kind of explanations of addiction. There's physiological addiction, which would be like drugs and stuff. It, it creates a change in your body and you become dependent on it. And then there's the psychological addiction, which is more like habits and cravings. And with food, a lot of people use food to control their emotions and control the way they feel. Yes. So let's just imagine a piece of cake. You like, I love cake. I'm sure you love cake. You've already said you love um, Dutch bread and things like that. Used to. Used to. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Used to. Um, it's not really that we want. It's the change of state, the change of emotion, the change of feeling that we get from it. So a lot of people use food to control the way they feel. And they've used, they've created a habit to use food, which is not serving them because they're overweight. And they use food to, like I said, yeah, make them feel a different way. So someone might have created a habit. Again, this is unconscious. So they don't really realize they're doing it to reduce stress by eating cake or feel happy by eating cake or not feel bored by eating cake or getting a treat yeah getting a treat feeling good we we use food in positive and negative ways when we feel bad we use food to make ourselves feel better when we celebrate we use food to make ourselves feel even better yeah and that's another thing completely like we we kind of have to use something external to heighten our celebrations, which I'm not sure is a good or bad thing, but it's part of hum human um, nature. Mm. Um, so you have to kind of think about what food is being used for in your life. And it's not, uh, like you said before, it's, it's a, a long process. Understanding that you're, let's take stress, for example, you use stress, you might use food to control your stress. Mm. There's a lot of different ways you can control stress. Number one is like realizing why you're stressed. Um, is it your job? Is it your family life? Can that change? Is it anything you can um, modify? Or is it something like you're not getting enough sleep? Are you not drinking enough water? You're not eating right. Um, you don't exercise. So it's not necessarily um, the only thing that can help you with your problem, but your your mind has found a way to solve that problem easily, quickly, easily. It solves a problem, but it doesn't serve you at this moment of time if no. you're trying to lose weight. No, Harry, I we could we could literally have a completely separate podcast on, on this topic. <laughs> and you, yes. you're not doing a podcast on this topic. I think you should do one <laughs> definitely. I know. <laughs> um, it's 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 fascinating, and I think in just chatting with you and I'm being challenging on purpose because I know like you do, it is a massive problem and a massive issue. It's been a massive problem for me in my life for many years and I've overcome a huge amount, but I still haven't arrived. Do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. an ongoing process. Although I know myself I've achieved masses, I still know I've got, I've got some way to go. And um, so it's a great, great thing that you're doing. So I, I know you're targeting a specific type of audience as well with this. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I've done a lot of um, like business development over the last year or so and deciding because in business nowadays, it's really hard to attract people being very general with what you're advertising, especially like fitness online. There's so many people out there mm. helping us and it becomes hard to, um, to create a business out of that because there's so many people doing it. Some people are charging hardly anything. And so you need to do something to stand out. So the way you do that in business is you create a small pool of people, which you can help and do something specifically for, uh, for yes. and aim something specifically for them. Yes. And, what you do by that is you create the um, the content, the advertising that resonates more with them and they see the value in it more. Mm. So my new business is actually going to be helping 
brides lose weight before their wedding. Yes. So obviously, this is a very small pool of people. Mm. Encapsulates encapsulates a certain target market, and so all my content and um, help is specifically for that problem. Like brides have a specific problem. If yes. I was targeting general fitness and a bride came to me, I might not have a solution that would be specific for them. Yes. So yeah, my new business is um, targeted more towards the brides. So. That is what I'm working on at the moment. I'm trying to help brides lose weight for their wedding. It's a very different market because it has some conflicts with my values. So with brides, they want to lose weight for a specific day, of course. Yes. And their motivation and drive is the look on their wedding day. Mm. So in my program, I kind of – I try and change – the way they think about their the health and fitness and try and create a drive for them to want to lose weight for other reasons rather than just their wedding day yes. and try to continue it and see the value in being a healthier, fitter, stronger, uh, yeah, better person. And but there might be some longevity. They may have a purpose to begin with. So there's an overriding you know, pain there. I can't be fat for my wedding. Therefore, I've got to lose weight for my wedding. There's like a a drive in them that will really push them through to overcome something. But what you're hoping for is that after they've done that, they will continue the journey to, to have a healthier life thereafter. Yes, exactly. And it comes from the way most people go about weight loss they do it in the conscious mind they think like i said before yes i want to lose weight it's um all logical and using willpower mm, and you can do that for, yeah you can do that for a short amount of time like if you do a you can force yourself to go on a diet and do exercise for a few weeks maybe even a couple of months if if you see that end point and really really um work on it but because you've not worked on those subconscious things once you stop you go back to how you were before. And that's a big problem because, yeah, that's what causes the, the circle, the cycle of yo-yo dieting and people starting again because they haven't done it in the right way. Yeah, got it, got it. Well, I say I've got it. I understand intellectually what you're saying, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think everybody will, you know, agree with you and then going to go, okay, how the hell do I put it into practice? But let's not go into that right now. <laughs> I think people need to get in touch with you. And one question I will challenge you on is say, what about the poor groom? Because yeah. when I was getting married, I recognised I had to lose weight <laughs> as well. Yeah. Well, like I said, um, I've I've selected a specific market. If I talk to um, brides specifically, it's not going to resonate with the groom. If I talk to the groom specifically, and when I'm talking, I sort of say my marketing and content. Yes. Um, so it um, waters down the solution. Right. So people get better results if they're um, following something that's specific for them. Got so, you. Um, yeah, it's really important to um, to do it that way. That's really interesting. I. I... I like that and you know that's it's the first time where I hear somebody being so definitive about their target market and lots of people talk about you know you need to know who your business is targeting like a avatar or persona or whatever the title that they now give it these days yeah. and yeah well done to you that you know who you're targeting and you're very focused on that rather than get distracted and water yeah. it down. That's awesome. Well done. A, a little analogy, actually, that I like related to that is in the food industry. Mm. So a lot of people like steak, for example. Mm. And if you like steak, you've got two options. You could go to somewhere like Weatherspoons that does a lot of things on their menu, and they've probably got steak as well. Mm. And it's cheap and cheerful, um, but you're getting steak. You don't really know what you're getting. Or you could go to a really good steak restaurant that has all the different steaks. They know all about them, how to cook them, and you get a really good steak. 
and you pay a bit more, but you get what you want and you enjoy it more and it's more valuable to you. Mm. So you've got those two options and it's the same in the health and fitness world. You go to the person that caters for everyone. It's cheap and cheerful. You might get a f- few results, but if you want really good results, you go to someone that does something specifically for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you feel special as well, don't you? The customer then feels special. They are only exactly. looking after me and they've got no distraction with other people. Yes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant, Harry. I, so tell me, where can people find you and learn more about what you're up to? Tell us the websites, um, etc. Yeah, so um, I've got two main places that I I post um, general health and fitness advice because I understand a lot of people are trying to lose weight. So apart from my my bride business, um, I post public videos on Facebook. So my Facebook page is um, facebook.com. Let me just check this actually. <laughs> um, while I'm looking for this one, my Instagram is Harry at Harry Snell. Um, so there's show notes, isn't there? Yeah, I'll put uh, all this which, in the notes. Yeah. So yeah, just call them out. You don't need to. My my Facebook is uh, facebook.com forward slash H Snell, that's S N E W L one, where I post um, public videos. And I've also got a YouTube channel, um, uh, my name, Harry Snell. And there's about 100 videos on there, um, different health and fitness topics, basically questions to what people ask me. So I've pre-recorded them and have answers to give to people. Now, seeing as you're a linguist now, and you're Portuguese and <laughs> Ricardo and all that, <laughs> yeah. you, um, do you know what your surname means in Dutch? Oh, well... Only from what people have told me, maybe it might mean fast. Correct. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Harry fast. Yeah. So um, I, I obviously noticed that when I first met you. That <laughs> I didn't say it at the time, but I'm saying it to you now. But you already knew that. So that's cool. Yeah, it's an interesting one. A lot of people have, have seen my name and said that. Um, but apparently, I don't know exactly, but it's roots or more recent roots are from um some english place in the south of england um wow. i'm not sure exactly where mm. and exactly the, yeah but there could have been some yeah migration of um people from northern europe yeah who knows who knows oh we're all connected in some yeah. way it's ridiculous yeah Harry, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been absolutely wonderful to hear your story, to hear what you're now up to. Uh, I I know that with your new project, your new business, you're going to be very successful because it's it's a, a problem that lots of people need solving. So um, it's it's um, definitely the market to be in these days. So well done to you. And and I'm sure we'll see each other again at a future event because that's where we met before. Uh, I look forward to that and we can catch up and uh, hopefully find out that you'll be starting your uh, podcast maybe in the future as well. <laughs> yeah, it's a funny one, actually, because um, I thought about it yesterday. Um, I've got a friend who likes talking to me about yeah, health and fitness and mm-hmm. we can talk quite a lot about it. Um yeah, I'm not going to go off on this and rant about it, but yeah, it's something I had thought about before. Um, but yeah, thank you. That was my first podcast and I really enjoyed it. And um, you can see I'm quite passionate about the health and fitness world, so I can just talk about it a lot. Um, one thing, though, I found it quite strange being interviewed and not me asking questions back to you. So it's quite a, an unusual kind of um, feeling situation. Well, I'd, and I know also that you were a little bit hesitant because you didn't feel you had much of a story. So this podcast, when it goes out, it will be at least an hour and a half. So I think we managed to cover quite a lot of ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you asked me about doing a podcast, I think my initial reaction was, um, I don't think I'm ready. I don't think I have enough to say. And, and that's a belief thing. Like, yes. Um, yes. As you can see, as you just said, um, anyone I'm, can talk about anything. 
I'm glad you you took this opportunity again to push through something, go in a in a zone of being uncomfortable. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah. now, um, and this is actually a suggestion for you and any other listener that is listening who are running their own small business. Um, get yourself on as many podcasts as you can. Two reasons. One, it helps you with your promotion, your story, and telling what you're doing in your business. And number two, it's practice talking about what you're doing. Oh, and number three, also, it um, podcasters are always looking for guests, guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Unless you're talking about, you know, some of the big ones that are interviewing celebrities. But I, I guarantee you, 99% of the time, if you ask a podcaster, can I be on your show? The answer is yes. Let's mm-hmm. just fit you in at, at a point in time in the future. But you'll get on there because they're always looking for guests. Exactly. And it goes back to what I was saying about being specific, like people in your niche, that things you do, mm. um, you will have something that's valuable to that audience, won't you? Yes. Definitely. Always. Yeah. Brilliant, Harry. Take care and see you soon, I'm sure. Awesome. Thank you very much, Michael. Bye for now. See ya. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.